Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. I'm sitting, actually, I'm sitting with two of my friends, but I'm sitting with my best bud, Tone. What's up, buddy? What's happening, brother? Nothing. We, uh, we, we have a, uh, we have two special guests, but, uh, we have a hair industry special guest today. And I think, is it, well, this is the first time, is this the first time we've ever done a podcast podcast together? Like, we've done some, like, that we've all been in the studio together before, but never like this, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so either. That's we didn't have enough mic. Like, what you so that voice that you hear that that's our our dear friend Katie May. Um, for those of you that don't know, Katie May is the one that keeps us uh, uh, afloat. You know, uh, Tony and I we come in and you know put our pretty faces and our pretty voices on the mic. But uh, Katie, she's the, the one, shoulders. She is. She yes. She, she turns is. the head. <laughs> she she's it all. Katie, welcome, dude. What's up? So today's a special day. Go ahead. No, I was just saying we didn't have enough mics. That's why we couldn't all do it together. <laughs> I assure you, we have an, we are, we have enough mics, um, but uh, but I don't know if we have enough space. I guess is that is, is if that's mm -hmm. the case. Hey, Katie. So um, so today is your special guest. So you met our guest today, and you know, within minutes, you reached out to me. You're like, we have got to have this guy on the podcast. Yeah, for sure. I um started working with Pureology, doing some education, and I get to meet so many cool people doing that. And um, not to give away too much, but a lot of their leadership team, I'm totally inspired by. And this was by far, yeah, as soon as I met him, it was like, yeah, okay, we have a cool story. And then every time I talk to him or I'm in person with him and doing education with him, I learn something more about his story. So I look forward to every time we do education together because I'm learning more and learning more. And it's so interesting. And he's a really cool dude. So I'm glad for you guys to meet him, too. He's, he's the kind of guy, even in the pre-talk here, you know what I mean? I feel like we've been friends for, for 20 years. He's just that kind of guy. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm looking forward to getting in. I'm looking forward to getting into his story. It's 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 really cool, though, like what you said and like what I'm what I keyed in on is like you've been in the room with him a lot. And every time you look forward to it, I mean, if you talk about like, like the pinnacle of like an educator, right? Like, like someone that's always giving you something new, you know, because I think so many times you go to a class and then if you go to that class again, or even if you go to that class 10 years later, it's, it's a lot of the same stuff being recycled, the same jokes, the same points, the same, whatever that, that, that you can lose that like interest in like, do I really need to see this person again? But he fires you up every time with new knowledge and with a new story. But, but, you know, there's certain people because you can hear the same joke by 10 different guys, but there's always that one guy for some reason makes it funny or makes it interesting. You know what I mean? And you've heard it a thousand times, that same joke, but that one person just draws you in. And he's that kind of guy. Are you talking about the uh, the text thread that we had yesterday with all the dad <laughs> jokes and Katie was uh rolling? No. You, you, you know, I it's was bad subject to. Even... You know what's bad? Like, even, like, in a text message, you can see Katie rolling her eyes. Yeah. <laughs> it was, we were going, uh, and I'm like, oh, Katie's loving this. Loving yeah. this. I put that in quotation. Katie's loving this. Well, that was awesome. So, so uh, Katie, um, I, I, well, it's your guest. Introduce him. All right. Well, yeah. So today we have with us Mr. Yurish Hooker. Thank you so much for coming on with us, Yurish. I'm so excited for the guys to meet you and for us to dig into your story a little bit. It's such a pleasure, Katie, honestly. Like, first of all, as I as I said before, before the recording was going, but just to say it again, you know, anytime um, anyone asks me, you know, to, to speak, you know, anytime, and, and especially a teammate, you know, of which you are one of my teammates, you know, all you ever have to do is ask and I'll always pick up, the, like the bat phone, I'll always pick that joint up, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and it's always a pleasure. And uh, anytime I get to really communicate with people, you know, and really share ideas and have meaningful conversations, it's always worth my time. 
So always, you know, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'm ready when you are, you know. Let's do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Where are you from? Where am I from? I am from Hell's Kitchen, New York City. Oh, snap. Hell's Kitchen, New York City, when Hell's Kitchen was New York City. It is now being referred to as Clinton. Mm. That's right. So, is that where you were born and raised? I was born, yes, I was ra raised in Hell's Kitchen, New York City. Um, not to, I, I, I hate doing it, and my wife is getting on my, on my, on my butt about this. Um, so I, I say this for context, not for age. I am, I am 51. So I grew up in Hell's Kitchen, New York City as a kid in the 70s. And Hell's Kitchen is ultimately Times Square in the 70s and the 80s. So that's where I grew up. And I grew up around all of the things that, you know, when you look at old video about the 70s in Times Square, let me just say the rumors are true. There was not a store in all of Times Square that was not either a strip club, a dirty movie house, or um, a head shop. And the head shops actually were a lot heavier back then. They used to straight up sell like the cut for drugs and they would sell triple beam schemes. Like it was a total, they, they, you could get a fake passport or a fake driver's license in the, like for real, for real. Not like, like the, the kitty version. Like it was that type of an outlaw type of environment. So that is where I grew up. So for those kids listening in, a head shop is where us uh, us old heads would have to go to buy like a to buy like a bong or a bowl or or any kind of like paraphernalia that now you can pick up at Walmart, frankly. But you know, we we used to go to like special we used to go to like special stores and stuff to 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 get these things. And 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 like Yuri said, like we would go in the back and then there would be like this photo booth set up and you could get like a, you could get like a legit fake ID there. Now the one that we had in DC, I think that at the top of the ID, it literally said fake ID, <laughs> you know, but, but you know what? Nobody cared, which is crazy. Yeah, like you did everywhere. Yeah, that's true too. You and know? you know something while, while we're on the topic, and I think this in, in some respects is at minimum as relevant, if not more relevant. Um, also, with who I grew up with. My, my family, my parents are, are quite unique as well in the sense that, you know, my father, he's a, he's a free jazz musician. You know, both of my parents are activists um, on a number of different fronts. Um, still together after 50 something years. They've been together since I think junior year in college. And uh, I share this because, you know, um, at that time, you know, this is, I, I, I grew up also in Soho, in the loft scene of free jazz, you know. Um, so I was in a lot of these underground spaces as a little kid, like behind my dad's drums, you know, while he's playing. Uh, I always have a funny memory that I, I it, yeah, of we used to like old school, we'd be wheat pasting his, his flyers for his gigs mm -hmm. on the lamppost. And worth noting, you know, it's so funny, you know, and, and with you with, with referencing the old heads. And I share this because, you know, now, if anybody saw a parent with a five-year-old carrying a bucket of wheat paste at 1030 at night, wheat paste, I mean, I'd be a CPS in 10 seconds. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> like, not then. They were like, oh, look at that. Isn't that cute? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, anyway, you know, and we're walking through doing this. In the place like I was describing to you in Times Square on top of it. So like we're walking past hookers. I mean, it's a whole situation. You know what I'm just like carried with and the thing that bothered me the most, which Katie, you'll totally appreciate, you know, because you know the way I show up for these events, what bothered me the most was that the wheat paste, as I was carrying it, because I'm five, it kept spilling on my clothes. I was like, oh no. I was like, this is just not the way I want to show up to the world already. You know what I'm saying? And it's so <laughs> Hilariously. Anyway, so I share that because it gives a lot of context. It gives a lot of context because, you know, my parents, I, um, well, we'll get into my story in a lot of regards, but um, I can't say that my parents are super creative. They're open to creative lifestyles. They're creative. They're open to all of those things. You know, my parents are mixed race couple before mixed race couples were like a thing. They got together in 67. In 67, what, I think 12 states in this country, like black and white people couldn't even get married in 67. You know, so 
there's this type of way about them that um, allowed for a lot of creativity, um, a lot of exploration. Um, um, the thing, there was no like, you'll never get a job doing that. There was like, hey, if that's what you did, do it, do it. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know, there was like, it, can you pay rent? Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's relevant. But it was like this whole thing of like security through money. It's like, it's your family. It's, it's the people who you choose to be in your circle that provide you security. Money comes and goes. Mm. You know, and I obviously I grew up with no money, so there you go with that. You know, and 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 you know what? I stand at this moment. I look at my parents, and it's you know I've, I've done things differently, but again, we'll we'll talk further. But um, you know, they never really focused on money, and those two are living the life of dreams. They're, literally, everything they want to do, they're doing. My father actually is uh, on a tour in California right now. Him and my mother are running around San Francisco someplace. He just played two sold out sets in SF somewhere. He's still oh born. Oh my gosh. He like, he, he, I think he released two two records, two records, two records. He, re he released like two records this year. Wow. Stop. Well, dude, you gotta, like, are, are they on like, uh, 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 like the movie? I mean, the, uh, the, the music apps? They're on music apps, they're on CDs. And he's still he's he's. Why the hell are we talking to you? Where's your dad? We need to be talking to your dad, bro. Okay, I know. I'll, I'll get you on. I'm out. He's <laughs> no, what, you know what I'm saying? Uh, right? you give your dad. Give your dad a shout out. Like where the hell can we find his music, bro? Oh, okay. My dad's name is William Hooker. Um, during the course of this, I will have my fabulous. Uh, I will ask my fabulous wife to figure out what exactly his website is. And then we can share because that's where you can purchase all of his music. That's but 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 okay. relevant and and also yes to that. So we'll make sure that we have that info too because I would love to give him the shout out on that. That's awesome. But that's the type of environment that I grew up around. Do you because, know? So, just for the record, uh, you were talking about interracial uh, uh, relationships and, and early on. Um, I think I think Love versus uh, uh, Virginia was 1968. So yeah, that's, you're that's right. Got, that, it was right. 68 before the federal government right. um, made it right. legal or illegal, you know, to, uh, but that was 68. And Absolutely that's, right. that's a whole nother story. I can go, we can go yeah. wait on that rabbit hole, but we won't. <laughs> All yeah. right. So, so, so we grew up in Hell's Kitchen. Do we know why it's called Hell's Kitchen? And was that the official name or was that the slang name? Probably the slang name. Hell's, Ki Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen got its, it, it got its reputation. Um, that transformed over time, just like every area and everything, you know, um, back in uh, with uh, Irish gangs. Mm. It's a very, it's a dockyard uh, area. Hell's Kitchen, I grew up on 10th Avenue. There's only 12 avenues in Manhattan, you know, so the docks and the piers were all along what for me on the west side is the Hudson, uh, Hudson River. You know, so all those docks were, you know, docks there to this day, dock areas are rough areas. You know what it's, I'm saying? Uh, you can't walk 10 feet without seeing a cop these days. So I can't imagine what was going on in 1910 or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> All right, so there's that. Do you know? And uh, and um, it, it transformed over time. West Side Story is a story that takes place in Hell's Kitchen, for instance. Ah, like Hell's Kitchen Story. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, I think the Puerto Rican uh, person within that relationship was in the neighborhood above from these projects. They're actually right behind Lincoln Center. And the uh, Caucasian person who I, yeah, I, I actually believe it was Irish actually in West Side Story was from Hell's Kitchen. They, um, I, I think the, origi the original uh, story that was written, it was supposed to be like Italians versus Irish. But then, but but then after World War II, with the influx of, of the Puerto Rican, um, with the Puerto Ricans in New York, they they changed the they changed the the the, the heritage or the, or the whatever of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think I think, that, I think that that's a true story. I don't know. I could be making it up, but it sounds pretty good. So we'll go with it. <laughs> I'll yeah. go with it. Right. I'll go yeah. with it. I'll go with it. We went to we went to a bar. Were you with me when we went to that bar in Hell's Kitchen? It was called like the slaughtered pig or something like very hell's kitcheny. Yeah. <laughs> and then we walked by that alley and they were trying to get us going inside that. No, no, that was a different time. Oh, <laughs> that was forty. <laughs> that was actually Forty Second Street. This is like we were in Hell's Kitchen and we went to like it was like this wild bar. I, I swear it was like named like the slaughtered pig or or or. Oh no! Or no! 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 I know where you went. 
you were in the meatpacking district, another place that I used to go with my dad and play gigs. He had he played this place in the cooler. They didn't even rehab it from being a meat cooler. It still had the hooks in the ceiling, actually, and you play gigs there. You went to Hogs and Heifers. That's where you went. And that was in meatpacking districts, which is below. And that's that wild bar with the bras on the ceiling and all that stuff. It's not there any longer worth noting. Do you know what I'm saying? But I think I would anticipate that that's where you went. I'm not going to say you're lying because I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I just remember, you're going to one hall. Sounds like a great night. You know, yeah. So it's okay. You know, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was crazy, man. It was definitely like a uh, uh, not a hole in the wall or whatever you call it. You know, like. It, but I like I like how he knows all these places. But he's like, yeah, my dad took me here. Yeah, like, yeah, my, my dad. dad, my dad. <laughs> I mean, my dad. We would get out the cab, and he'd be like, "Now, worth noting, and why it's so funny too." Meatpacking is like this, like you'll see like Maseratis and Lamborghinis and like people from Dubai and stuff wandering around. I remember getting out the cab because my father's a drummer, right? So you can't just walk down the street with drums. It's not like a saxophone. So you got a cab, you had the cab. So he'd be like, you better keep those, and I'm five, also worth noting, man. You better keep those drums off the ground. Don't get blood on my cases. Because it was the meatpacking district still, and there would be all the animal blood on the sidewalks. And you'd be like, I'd be like, oh no. But like, first my pants from the wheat paste, now my shoes from this. I'm like, please, I'm like, I don't understand. Anyway, so <laughs> I go on with these crazy stories, you know, but anyway. So that's oh, another yeah. memory of that. Yeah. So he's got totally. one one leg stiff with the wheat paint and the other one like covered in blood. <laughs> Yeah, some strong so, sodas to hold those drums up and out. That yeah, exactly. That's it. You know, stay fit. I feel like like a kung fu flick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's, that's did you, awesome. Did you did you get into music? I did. I did. Um, I played a number of different instruments. Um, I my dad taught me how to play drums since I was young, and I'm um, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm the founding drummer of actually what is now a, a quite quite a famous punk rock group. Actually, I was a punk rocker in, in the '80s to the '90s, so um, that was an experience. I, I was yeah, I was a founding drummer. We toured, recorded. Uh, the name of the band is The Casualties. They're actually on tour right now in Europe, I believe. So I give them a little shout out too. You know, great bunch of guys. Uh, uh, and uh, that was my experience with that. My my punk rock years was really quite something, actually, um, which led to really ultimately a lot of my life, my approaches. When you brought up the Navy SEAL guy, you know, a lot happened during those years. Those were very crazy times for me, you know, and they were like, I still, I've been with my wife since 2017. We chat. You know, talk a lot, actually. We we have a great time together, right? And I, to this day, can tell stories. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah. I was like, oh, and that happened on that tour. That happened at that gig. Like, oh, yeah, that's when we got arrested for inciting a riot. You what? Like, it was like, <laughs> like that. You know what I'm Like, so, and after all this time, there's still stories behind that. And if I lived another, if we, if we would live to 200, I'd still have stories from that time. It was very, uh, it was really quite something. Yeah. So that yeah. that was that. Yeah. You're yeah. Each, so you've pretty much lived, you know, like two lifetimes. So then how do you end up in hair? I'm so sorry, because this becomes important and relevant too, because prior to the punk rock thing, then because I was in New York, I was around a lot of the birth of hip hop. So mm -hmm. that actually took place prior to that, which is a whole other set of stories that's where I can fun. introduce you to my friend Roger, who took me. Oh my God, this guy! My wife, we just stopped, we just happened to re meet. I hadn't seen him for thirty something years. I just bumped into him recently in Hell's Kitchen, you know, seeing my dad for Father's Day actually, you know. And that's a whole other story of working for an outlaw biker and frankly stealing cars, and just the whole kind of crazy situation like that. And then came the punk rock time. Which lasted till about yeah till twenty six till twenty six actually yeah so and then and I could speak a little bit about how that ended because it actually um, you know what I'm gonna tie it all together for you Katie if that's all right 
Mm-hmm. Um, right. So the way the way my time with the casualties ended, and and you know I'm okay with this, and and you know um, I I actually was a really uh, I had a very very serious drug habit, very serious, um, heroin, cocaine, like it was, it was like I was like the Keith Moon. People in punk rock were like, "Yo, this cat is crazy." Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I was literally like, you know, when the drummer from the from Guns N' Roses get kicked out by Slash? Do you know what a commentary that is? I got kicked out by punk rockers from the '80s of the group I was in. Let's just put it that way. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Right. And uh, at 26, what I, I wound up homeless. You know, for for a period of time, not not years. Oh, well, well, hold on, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. So, so no. you were so. I was just tying it together to move on to the second question, but if you want, I'm open, I'm there, yes. Yes. Here's the story I'm hearing. So you were using a lot, and the band was like, the band was like, well, this isn't good for anyone. So they were like, they were like, Yuris, you got to go. Mr. Mr. Hooker, you got to go. You got to go do something else, but you can't do it here. Is that the story I'm hearing? Uh, Yes, yes, yes. I mean, long, long story short. Do you know, ultimately, it's a, it's a bigger story, too, in the sense that, do you know, um, at least from, this was my experience, you know, whoever out there is from my era, CBGBs, 80s, 90s, punk rock, hardcore scene, you know, that's your story, but this is what I saw, was at a point, you know, people were drinking, maybe you do a little blow, smoke some pot, you know, whatever, do you know, and then the scene really turned into, it got real drug heavy. Lower East Side became like a drug war zone, actually. And it wasn't, it was a, it was a safe prior, but that's got its own history. You can read about William Burroughs running around the Lower East Side in the 50s with a gun, cop, and heroin. Do you know what I mean? That's the history of that area, do you know? And, uh, and so it was crazier even then. So it got very inundated by that. Um, and, 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 and right now it's kind of interesting. They're, they're the only, um, member now that I know that's still in that group. He was a kid, you know, uh, when he joined the group and he carried on the tradition of the casualties, you know, in many regards, we wanted to create a movement, not just a band and, and, you know, good for you. Hey, you know, add Jake, good for you, man. You did it. You know what I mean? And um, it changed, you know, it wasn't really what, you know, me and the other, you know, original members wanted for it or dreamt of it, but you know, that's the evolution of anything, right? And so, um, so it was that, but it was, a, it was a, a bigger lesson and I share this because I do want to connect it all to Katie's question because there's a lot of things that I learned, a lot of things that I learned about being a teammate, a lot of things that I learned about being a leader, a lot of things that I learned about time, a lot of things that I learned about personal development, a lot of things that I learned about a lot of things happened in this time. And that's why I connected because that's what I actually do for a living now. And in many regards, it started with that. And, you know, again, to, to tie in the story and what the question you just asked, yes, that is what happened. It happened to a number of us, particularly with me, do you know, and um, particularly, um, it was a hard one, you know, because as uh, as any of them will say, I mean, I'm reconnected with all the old members now. You'll see pictures on my Instagram, the wilder haircuts that you see me doing, and I'm with this whole group of people. They look like this crazy band. Those are my old band. One of them's my old, he's my brother from when we were kids. We were, We grew up together. You know, I knew him since I was 15 years old. You know what I mean? We're reconnected now. So it's like the person where we used to buy records, punk rock records from, he owns the record store we used to now buy them from back when we were kids. You know, I know him. We're, 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 re- we're re-release, re-releasing, which is like little teaser. You know, <laughs> I got I got the um, test pressing. They're, they're re-releasing all of our early recordings now. You know, that's a project in play for the band that I was in, a re-release of the early years of the casualties, you know? So so these are all people I know. And I say this because, you know, as hard as it was for them to do this, and I share this with, you know, moving into my, my, my life now, it was difficult because they love me and we were family, but this isn't working. And I wasn't changing on my own. And it was time to at least say goodbye, but it was actually wound up being a see you later. Do you know what I mean? But 
And I share that because all everything, so much of the way I show up now, when I say like, Katie, you call me, you're my teammate. I'm, I'm picking it up like the bat phone. Like it's a joke. It's a joke. And it's not. You know, I remember when I didn't do that for people that were very important in my life. My life is that type of a story, right? It doesn't, it's, it's not separate books. It's chapters all in one book, if you dig where I'm coming from. Do you know, and, and I say this in my business development work. I say it in my personal development work. I say it in all of these different respects. When I came to this field, I started late, man. I started this job, man, woman, you know. <laughs> I actually started Katie, because now I'm like, I, you asked the question, now I'm all up to people. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, all right. You know, and I say this because, and I'll say this a lot, like everybody asks, oh no, how do I, I got to figure out this industry. It's like, no, you know, you need to figure out, you need to remember how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you make excellence? Did you know, it? fine. You're one of those people who got into this career super, super early, you know, 15 years old. You got your license at 16. This isn't a rare story in our industry. I meet them all the time. Do you know what I mean? They inspire me. Do you know? And it's like, hey, you know, how do I stay inspired? How do I stay committed? How do I make sure that I stay with excellence? You know what? When was the last time you did it? I, could, I remember I was doing that when I was in second grade drawing. I wanted to be an illustrator and a graphic designer. That's what I really wanted to do with my life. I had scissors. I don't even know what you're talking about. I went to school to be an animator. I wanted to be an illustrator. I designed my first record cover when I was like 14. Do you know what I mean? So this is always, I'm back in art now. I'm sketching again, you know, because again, it all weaves. These are threads that weave together and make up our lives. So frequently I'll ask people, oh, how do I do this? It's like, think back to the last time you did it. That's how. How'd you stay inspired? When you were 10, how did you wake up every morning and then create whole alternate dimensions for your Barbies? You know, that's, I'm just throwing that out there. It's you know? topical, we're good. Right, and it's, like, and it's like, how do we stay creative? I don't know, how'd you do that? It's the same mind. It's the same thought process. How did you how did you play in your room with like two cars? <laughs> what I ate for three hours. Do that. You'll stay fresh in your career for a lifetime. I think so you know much. I, mean? I, I think so. I mean I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think that, you know, as you get older, life gets hazy, right? There, there's a lot more, there's a lot more stuff to see through. To, to, to kind of get back to, to, to that inner child, to that, to that person. You know, I think, I also think that, that we live not making excuses, but we live in a society where, where work is supposed to be work. It's not supposed to be play, you know? And I, I also, I kind of think that that's a, that, that's a misnomer. Is that the word misnomer? We'll go with it. It is now. I think that that's, I think that that's a misnomer as well. Like, I think we are allowed to have fun. You know, and, and certainly, and certainly, like we've we've interviewed enough people who visited a hair salon and was like, "You guys look like you're having fun. I want to do this." You know, there's been so many people that have converted into the industry at that point. So, um, I I, I dig to like to like let, let's let's have fun with this. I hear you, and I agree. And fun is a choice. I could be on a factory line and having fun. That's the consciousness I bring to the event. The event doesn't make it fun or not fun. I look at the event and make it fun or not fun. And that's a very relevant thing in all of our perceptions about the way we view life, about the way we engage with it, and all of the experiences in it. You, uh, a line at the DMV, you know, oh, this sucks. Does it? You, you're making it suck. I don't know. You could have brought a book. You could be talking to the person behind you. A lot of interesting people at the DMV, <laughs> for better or for worse. You know what I'm saying? Right? So, like, I, and I, I say that too. You did? You know, so I think people are looking for a profession that's intrinsically fun. There was a time in my career, it was not fun. I fucking hated it. And to be honest with you, it was when I was the busiest behind the chair. I was working like a slave building a pyramid for crying out loud. I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, this sucks. It was education that actually breathed new life into that situation. So it's like the, the career, oh, making money. The more money I'll make, the more fun I'll have. Yeah? Yeah, I, I tell you, I have a lot of people sit in my chair with all the money in the planet, and they're not having much fun. So no, that doesn't make fun. You make fun. Or not. Fulfillment. I, also, you know? I kind of disagree 
with you. Oh, Corey. okay. I'm in. No, 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 not you, Yurish, not what you're saying, with what Corey was oh, saying. Oh, well, what a kiss is that? Oh, okay, Katie. goodness. <laughs> Wait, did, please disagree with that. I love that. Do you know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, I was like, okay, oh. invite me on and then disagree. Okay, Katie. But now that I know you're going to disagree with somebody else, I'm going to sit back okay, and, yeah. and watch that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just, just from my perspective, I, I'm not to throw anyone under the bus. I'm a little bit younger than you guys. Um, so my generation. She throws everybody under the bus. <laughs> my generation. It's always the setup, right? I don't mean to. It's like, girl, then why are you doing it? Right. <laughs> I'm messing around. <laughs> I, my generation, there was this like, like college push and like, you got to do this and kind of trying to send a lot of people that direction but for me personally and I would think a lot of people who are in artistically inclined I was always more drawn to the fun jobs like you know the things that anything I did before going to hair school it was a job that I had so much fun with now maybe to Eurisha's point it was my way of looking at it it wasn't necessarily the job itself or like what I was taking out of it but, you know, even then, like going into hair school and, you know, coming out into a salon and working in that environment, it's not, you're not just in a salon. You're like a part of a team. You're going and doing stuff with these people outside of the salon. You're going to education in New York together. You're, you know, doing hair shows and going to all different things within the industry together. And um, I never, I have never once felt like I'm supposed to be working or doing something that's not fun so that in my off time I can have fun and I would hope a lot of people feel like that I know the younger generation coming up in the hair industry specifically are wanting to have way more fun or intentionally having way more fun in their job and choosing avenues within doing hair that are more intentional and more in line with their values um and not you know I'm gonna bust it out at a you know, commission-based salon for two years under a master stylist because that's what I'm supposed to do. They are making their own path and they're not letting anybody tell them how to do it. They're they're having fun and they're, you know, forging this path that's a little different than what we've been doing. So I don't know. That's just kind of my perspective on, you know, work I, first. I, I'm going to back up your each too. So we, we did a podcast with uh, um, DMJ right? Daniel Mason Jones. Mm -hmm. and how he found oh, the industry. He oh. was a teammate of mine for a long time. We worked together at uh, L'Oreal Professionnel together before I moved into my current role at uh, Purology, actually. Yeah, major brother in arms. Known him for many years. Incredible Love. to watch him grow. Oh, you yeah. Know? yeah. Anyway. If you know, if his story, how he found the industry, he, he was living in a morgue, right? Yeah. Uh, he learned how to mix different embalming fluids to like, so when you die, or if you drown, you're blue. So how do you get it back to, you know, whatever. Uh, if you, uh, you know, so you die of jaundice, you're yellow. How do you get back to, you know, so you may, he, so you can't say that when he found the industry was fun living in a morgue, mixing embalming fluid, but he did, he, he learned to love the industry or fall in love with the industry by his own perspective of doing that you know what i mean he loved the the just kind of creating uh and, and learning color in, in, in a completely different way so it's it's very perspective it's all how you think if i could jump in here right and i think it's interesting to bring up daniel mason jones and i say this because this is it's all perspective and it's all the way we look at things because there, here's I'll, I'll I'll put it this way, I know that there are excellent master morticians. Can can we agree? Right? They I don't necessarily know them, don't know them, I don't know, but I know they exist. And I say this because that is someone who loves what they do, even in a morgue. And so I I want to be really clear again in stating this: joy is where you find it. It's not a destination. And this is frequently really what the biggest. If, if I can look around. And if I'm looking at the world and in my experience in it from, you know, little kid in short pants, you know, to currently is I can say this. And I think it's becoming more, um, more pronounced, you know, more and more people always out here 
Where's my happiness? Where's my joy? Where's my contentment? Where's my security? I got to tell you something. Wherever it is, it ain't over here. You pick whatever you want. You know, you could be miserable in it or you could be joyful in it. You know, you can make connections with the people who you're doing it with or you cannot. You know, you can create a team atmosphere or you could uh, have a, an atmosphere of isolation. That's every workplace. You know, and that has to do with like what culture is developed by the leaders, who is the leader that may be more in a position. But just to back this up, and I think this is relevant, how did I stumble into this? First of all, I wanted to be a graphic designer, and this is important because graphic design is largely geometry. And I say this because color, if we get back down to really what that is, that's chemistry, right? And as we all know, I could be in high school totally acing geometry and totally flunking chemistry, right? So I so there's that. So I already have an eye towards geometry because I want to be a graphic designer. That's really where my history is. Old school too, not on a computer. We used to do old school mechanicals where you would still use rulers and you would have to figure out perspective. It didn't automatically like put a point and then it made all the perspective shoot out. It's like, no, you had to make the point and you had to create the event horizons for all of the different angles, right? Yourself. And I share this because honestly, after the time of being homeless, I left that time very lost. I hadn't been working towards anything other than rock and roll all night and party every day since I've been 16, right? And now I'm 26. So one, I go into, uh, and this is relevant of how I fall in and you'll see, and it's going to tie into everything. I promise. I know I weave a tail, but trust me, I'm going to take you to someplace worth traveling. <laughs> trust me, right? So after this time, I study, I get a certificate cer certification to be a substance abuse counselor. Right. So let's be clear on what that is. Being a substance abuse counselor is ultimately a master of communication. You're learning to communicate with people who are the most difficult type of people to communicate with on the planet, other than people who are literally um, like seeing a different reality due to a certain, you know, um, uh, 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 a mental condition that may be going on, like a schizophrenia or something like that. That makes it like, it's a whole, I don't even, I don't know, that's not my field of expertise. But I know that from, from, from that, that's a very difficult thing to connect with. Ah, okay, right, I tried that. After, directly after uh, by that situation of homelessness, actually the first thing I did was I was actually apprenticing under a commodities trader in the Old World Trade Center. I was with him for a number of years. I was actually going to be a commodities trader. I was learning to take my Series 7. That didn't work out because my boss got arrested after a certain amount of time. It's a long story, right? I had to leave that, right? Then I do the substance abuse counseling thing. Boom, then I do that. So now, right, now worth noting, what do I do now? I do business development. Oh, how interesting. Because that's what I did for years. I learned. How to, how to, everything that's about business, everything about evaluating the company, numbers, everything. I learned it there. Communication. Oh, look at you reach teaching facilitation, teaching this, do this. Wow. Look, I learned how to do that there. And might I also add, you know, that whole thing, oh my God, I'm afraid to be on stage. I guess I learned that when I was in the casualties. So now I'm not afraid to stand in front of a room and speak in front of hundreds of people. I've already done that behind drums. So I get together with this woman. Who happens to be a hair colorist. I moved to SF to be with her. My initial job falls through. It was retail management. I was going to go into retail corporate. I was like, what the hell am I doing? And my ex-wife, who is now my ex-wife, she says, you know what? And I'll never forget the words. You're really good with people and you're really creative. I bet you you'd love to cut hair. There's an opening at a salon that I'm trying out. It's this opening. You'll start at the front desk. And then eventually they're going to have an education program and that's where you start. And that's how I got into hair. I got into hair by saying a yes, because I was lost. I didn't have a passion about hair. The only thing I knew about hair was how to bleach it out to white. Maybe it'll fall out, maybe it wouldn't. How to put manic panic in it. And then there you go. Like that's what I know about hair. And I know how to cut Mohawks and Chelsea's. Do you know what I'm saying? Right? That's what I know about hair. And it was a simple yes. You know, I remember the first time I walked into a salon, I was like, wow, I've never seen a place like this before. Again, I grew up broken Hell's Kitchen. My grandmother was cutting my mother's hair. I had never seen a salon. 
let alone, I didn't even know that there was a haircut that that was expensive until I was giving it. I didn't know there were 20, 25, 30, 35, $40 shampoos. I didn't know, what are you even talking about? I knew about Aquanet Ultra Hole to put your mohawk up. And you know, my best friend Roger, cause he was slick like that. He used dippity doo to style his hair back in the early eighties. That's what I knew about that. So I walk in, right? And I'm like, oh my God. And I see people laughing and I see that. You know, and then I also, you know, then I'm also older because I'm 28 now. I'm not a kid going in here. So I look at it from another perspective. All the things, you know what, Katie? I didn't do any of that stuff while I was working. My ex-wife, she had two kids. I was going through an apprenticeship. I was going, I was married and I was helping raise two children, the two two of my stepchildren at the time. There was no go out with you, you and your teammates. There was no education trips to New York. There was, it's the weekend and we're all going to, you know, Six Flags Great Adventure. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm not mad at it because especially my, my, my stepson who was three and a half when I first showed up in his life in that, in that capacity, he, he's helped me see life new again. Without that experience, I don't even think I'd be here. Do you know what I mean? Because after everything else, like, boy, there wasn't much exciting in existence at all. It was something to get through. See, see how I weave it together? I'm telling you, I always get there. Right? I always get there, right? Because that's, you do. When, you do. That's, that's when I saw it. I was like, wait a minute. Do you know, I'm looking at life one way. Christmas, F Christmas. What the hell is that? You know, it's like, of course, I spent Christmas on the street homeless a year. I spent Christmas in the hospital OD'd at one point. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like Christmas. Who gives a shit about Christmas? Sorry. But there you go. Mm-hmm. That's my one. All right. <laughs> you know, and in that moment, then I see it through his eyes. It's like, oh my God, like he be- this kid really believes in Santa and I'm making a bike for the kid. I'm like, oh my God, wait, it's not Christmas. How am I looking at Christmas? And he saw he allowed me to see Christmas in a new light. You know, so ultimately the way I began this career was from a yes, it wasn't from a passion of hair, you know, and it, and then, and, and it became a passion, not of hair, um, it was creative. And I took everything I knew from the angles. It was actually harder for me to learn how to blow dry than to cut hair. And it took me a long time to cut, learn how to cut hair. It's, it's, a, it's craft, you gotta be a master at it. It takes time, do you know what I mean? But I understood it very clearly from a, um, uh, a conceptual perspective. Does that make sense? You said the angles. It's like, oh, I saw it. Just like I'm doing an old school mechanical. Do you know what I mean? And then, and then, and then, and then I just put it in here. You, when the, the first person who taught me how to hold a brush, a blow dryer, and take a section so that I could blow dry it, that was like, oh my God, that was the most miraculous thing I actually learned how to do ever, actually. Do you know, with that, forget the graduated Bob, which was tricky. Do you know what I mean? But it was nothing compared to the mystery of holding all of these things with two hands and taking a section, reclipping it. It was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? So that was really the entrance into it. And I share it because then education layers on top of that, which saved my career. You know, and again, what was that? That was another yes. Listen, you're not here right now. Katie will attest. We've been out to dinner. Right, Katie, am I, I'm loud, right? No. Yeah, and I always joke because yeah. if you hear me facilitate to a class, like I rarely need a mic. And mm-hmm. then like when you see me in dinner, I'm actually just as loud as when I was, you know. I'm, that is like, true. I'm half, I'm half Italian, I'm half black, and I grew up in Times Square. Like how, where is your quiet in any of that? Does that make sense, right? So. So, uh, and, and I share that because I was actually teaching my client how to style their hair and the head of education heard me doing it from across the salon. In the two seconds in between clients, she's like, you know what? You're really, you're really good at explaining stuff. You know, would you like to join the teaching staff at, at, at the salon? At the salon I learned my craft and it had five locations. We were teaching 40 apprentices at a shot. That's my first entrance into teaching anything. And we all did live models. I didn't even see a mannequin until I got until I got put on with L'Oreal Professional Products Division. All of my 
my entire training, four, four haircuts a week, four models a week, every week. If you miss three models per month, you were fired in the salon. I learned it. And everyone, and again, it was like bobs. It wasn't like bringing hair. It was like, no, bring in one length bobs. That bob has, that person has pre-existing layers that you can't cut to a one length. Actually, that's not a model. Send her away. It's inappropriate. You're not going to understand. That's, that's one for the month. You missed. Hope you get one with no layers next time. Then you start learning how to see it. Do you see it? All layers. Live models. I don't want it. live models. It's so hard to get. Yeah, live models. Trust me when I tell you, when you, are, when you grow up trying to find live models, by the time you're building your business, you walk the streets of San Francisco for eight hours for one full day to find four Bob models, approach a, over 100 people, right? To cut, to, to provide a haircut to four people, all Bobs. Trust me when I tell you, when you go to build your business, you're not going to be afraid to approach anybody. Layers. <laughs> no doubt. Does that make sense? It's all oh, yeah. layers. And we forget, we, we get so focused into a moment that we think that the skills of that moment are unique to that moment. They're not. You look to the past, you bring those skills with you, you know, and sometimes people forget to bring them along. And I share all of this again to what makes it fun and what gives it purpose. You know, you know, as it stands right now, honestly, I'm probably more in purpose than I am in fun, per se. And I have to tell you, purpose is I'm finding a lot more rewarding than fun. Mm. My time in the punk rock band was fun. That was like really fun. I got to <laughs> you know, however it ended Forgot up, I gotta it. tell you, I wouldn't get <laughs> back a minute. Even knowing where it ended, I'd be like, you reach, go back and do it all again. Exactly the same. There was I lived an experience in a life very few people get to, and that was fun. You know what? You know, watching people grow is fun, but it's more rewarding and purposeful than it's fun per se. Well, you know, at least, at least that one's sustainable. Yeah. You know, please. <laughs> Punk and it's a never, and it's and it's a self propelling engine. You know, to that point, right? You know, once you when, and once you see it, and once you see the people that you've taught, you know rise and you see some of them oh and this is you know this is the dream you know to see when when the student surpasses the teacher that's when I know I'm really I really served my purpose I don't want you to be as good as me I want you to be better than me if I've done my job that's what you're you're motivated to become that and I may not have all the skills to tell you how to become better well, and I want to slow you down real quick because you said please. something that I'm hit, sorry oh. see I'm at you now you lit you know, so. <laughs> is that is that what you said was I've served my purpose? Right? I'm serving. Wrong, serving. wrong. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. No, 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 it doesn't matter because I've served my purpose. Like this is where I am in your journey. You know, now it's time for you to take that torch and, and, and either create your own journey or to find the next the next Yoda, right? Yeah, so I've which served. Is many. Yeah, I've served my purpose. I love that. It, it, it's like a. It's like I've served my season in your life. And because, and I think this is important, listen, I'm very good at what I do. Whether it comes to facilitating, whether it comes to haircutting, very good. There are many people who are very good. So I don't say it like this. I say that uh, as one amongst many. And I also say it like this, and I think this is very important, you know, as now, you know, I, I'm director of development at Purology. I'm also the founder and CEO of my own brand, Eureka Style. You know, the thing that I think is such a key to anyone is to understand that there's always more than just your way. And just because your way isn't the best way, your way is literally just your way. And that's something to really wrap your head around when you get into a situation or, in, or if you're ever offered the opportunity to step into the shoes of leadership that allow you to start designing hair cutting programs allow you to teach people how to teach other people. It's really important that first of all, you yourself, you have to look around what else is going on or else then I'm going to cap off, right? Because now I'm the person who's obviously teaching it. So who's teaching me? So somebody has got to know something that I don't know. And I got to be open to that. And I got to be open to discovering that, oh, wow, I was doing it this way. It's like, ooh, time to go back in the lab. Do you know what I mean? Because I got to start instituting some of these new things that I learned from guess who? What? I'm about to hit you with this. 
from the person who I was teaching 10 years ago. Let me have that lesson. Tony, you did? You Tony, did? You feeling that? Yep. You know, right? There, there's a guy which a lot of people have heard of. You might have heard of him too, uh, Philip Wolf. Hmm. And Tony taught him back in the day at their salon. And now he's like this epic artist. And, you know, Tony, he used to teach a lot, like in their salons, all these people. And clearly he's a good teacher because they're all amazing and doing awesome things. Right. That's the, yeah, that's the exact prime example. Yeah. That's I love, I example. love back to Philip real quick. I love watching Philip teach Tony's techniques, you know, to, to, to a million followers. Like I go, Oh, that's just, that, that's Tony stuff, you know, but you know, certainly Philip owns it, you know? So what, totally. what's that? Uh, but uh, oh, uh, uh, nine inch nails. When when Johnny Cash did hurt, jo nine inch nails or or what's his name, Trent Re Resnick, Resnick, Resner. Like, he, Resner. He's like, that's no longer my song. You own it. So yeah. uh, so that's the feel I get from you. Like you feel you 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 own it. You got it. A thousand percent. And and I might also in, in, encourage us to look at it from this perspective. And this may be just where I'm at right now. And I'm I'm I'm. What can I say? You know, you know, life has its stages, careers has its stages. And I'm definitely I'm I'm being invited to look at a lot of things. My my prior experience. It's so funny. Me and my wife, we joke. It's like the second we hit 50, all of a sudden we're so reflective. <laughs> anyway. But, <laughs> it's like all the it's like it's like 49 didn't give a crap about nothing but the next 10 minutes. Now I'm like, oh, and oh, but anyway, right? Oh, so that is that is truth right there. Right? So I don't know what truth, truth that holy is. Cow. But what I, I don't know about that is <laughs> so you will. I'm Hopefully. giving you a preview, Katie. Don't worry about it. Bro. I got you. You know, I'm coming from the future to tell you what's happening. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? So it checks out. And, and something that I've, I'm, 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 I'm learning more about or mm, I'm finding true is more for myself. Right. I find that important, too. And I share this with Katie. And I, I want to accentuate that. See, even on the podcast. I'm presenting myself to the world. And if I don't say something correctly, I'll now actually stop so that I can. Words have power. The more people we are lucky to be in front of, the more people we're willing to serve. It's like, no, just don't keep talking. It's like, is that the right, is that what you meant to say? And it's like, wait a second, let me back that up. It's something that I'm stepping into. I, I always thought, you know, a lot of educators think you always have to be on and you always have to be right because I'm teaching you, so I can't be wrong. And I'm sharing that for the young educators out there, there's people starting out. Do you know, actually it's when you say something incorrect and you keep going that's, and acting like nothing happens, that's actually when you're wrong. <laughs> Admitting that something's happened and then stepping back to say it is actually very profound, I believe. But why I say this is um, at this point, I'm really looking at things not as either mine or someone else's, I'm looking at it like, wow, this is really the collective knowledge of our industry. And this is what I'm lucky to be a part of. I look at it, um, there's this quote that I, I saw, it still speaks to me right now. Um, Seek to be a part of a circle, not the top of a pyramid. Mm. Because when you're part of a circle, that means everybody in that circle has something valuable to give to it, has something valuable to take from it, and has something value to add to it no matter where you are. Could be a youthful perspective. Could be some cat who's not even out of cosmetology school yet. Just trust me, I'm sure they know some about social media that I don't. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's a relevant point right now. Do you know what I mean? There's things that I know that I will be able to share for as long as I live and will always remain true. Do you know what I mean? They're foundational principles. You know, we're not in the beauty business. We're in the communication business. You take that, you'd be beauty, you'd be, you'd be cutting hair, people's hair in the year 2300, and that'll still be true. Your haircut will never be something that will make you successful. How you do it, how you communicate the relationships you build will. That'll always be true. How you communicate it, that might shift. Maybe now I need to learn about TikTok. Maybe I need to learn about IG. Maybe I learn to learn about this. Maybe I learn to know, learn about this. This is about being part of that circle. You know, so I'm not, I don't always feel like I'm the person because I'm of a certain amount of years of experience and what have you that I need to keep feeding it so that we can keep on, you know, raising up the next, the next generation of hairstylists. I want to be a part of that. 
And I want to be a part of that along with people with less experience than me. I want to be a part of that with the contemporaries of the people who are that next generation of hairstylists who are the leaders that I can see. You can always see it, right? You can see in the 20 something year olds, it's like, oh, I see a lot of them. But I see a, I see a leader of what the next generation is going to be. No, hold on, hold on. I'm going to slow you down. So, what, so to you, like if you're, if you're gazing out to an audience, what's that leader look like? You know what that, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. I think that sometimes that can be more relevant than what it does look like at times. Uh, what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like the loudest one in the room who leads everything verbally. It doesn't look like that. This coming from the loudest guy in the room. This coming from the loudest guy in the room. <laughs> it can look like that, but it doesn't have to. And I think that that's something, a common trap people fall into, you know, is looking for that person who commands attention. That's not necessarily your leader. You know, I can tell you, it doesn't look like um, someone who acts like there's jobs. It looks like somebody who approaches um, uh, uh, an idea and knows that wherever the space is for them to step in and contribute to that idea, I'm in. It's like, oh, I'm, oh, oh, I know. I've had ten years experience of haircutting. I'm, I've styled, you know, multiple New York Fashion Weeks. Oh, and now I have to sweep your hair. Got it? Because that's what's going to keep this moving. That's what that, that, you see what I mean? That's so just so we can put an example of what that looks like, you know? Um, and it looks like someone, here's something that it does look like. Um, first, it doesn't look like someone who thinks it's about them and looks at their chance to lead as an example of an opportunity to showcase their abilities. That's not what it looks like, right? What it looks like is someone, what it does look like, is uh, someone who um, always is there for their team in whatever way that's necessary. And it's not a stratified thing. What it does look like when I look across that room and I see it, it looks like the person who's diligently focusing, having fun, but also taking notes. What it does look like is someone who when I ask questions and it doesn't have to be everyone, so I'm clear. It could just be that moment. It could be the drop mic question. Do you know what I mean? And that's all you needed to bring to the table. But it looks like someone who actually is going to step up and provide their opinion, even if it differs with others in the room. It's a person who has their own mind and has their own direction. When I see everybody doing something, and it could be positive, it could, you know, not, it could be, you know, neither here nor there, you know, but who's the person who's going to say, you know what? Actually, I have to prep for such and such. I'm be over here, you know, enjoy yourself. And then say that, wait, and this is important, and say that without judgment. It's like, I, I it's like, be clear. It's like, it's, it's not about do what you want, you know, and, and I respect you as a human being for it. I respect you as an individual for it. And that's your choice. And please, you know, God bless, you know, um, and I'm, I'm going to do this. And everybody's cool. Everybody's equal footing. And I'm not looking at your choice, you know, from a place of, ooh, I can tell you shouldn't do that. I can't wait to see you in the morning. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that. Do you know what I mean? I showed up many a morning with my 20s and I was fine. And it, the, the night before, it didn't look like that's the way it was going to go. You know, what I'm <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't know that. Do you know, you know, and, and, and it's somebody who, who gives without holding anything back. That's key. I don't want to hold secrets to keep an edge. My edge is my edge. My edge is because I'm Yurish. Katie, your edge is because you're Katie. You know, everybody's edge is because it's who they are. It's not because it's some trick or some skill you know. That's not your edge. You know, what you do, um, I just posted, I actually had this on my story yesterday. Don't confuse what you do with who you are, although I worded it differently, but it's very, it's a different. Do you know, uh, something that's really important too. Do you know, so when I look out at those rooms and I see who those leaders are, you know, there are people who are developing relationships. There are people who are fully engaged in where they're at and not thinking about like the night or, or what's coming next, but being fully present to the moment. It's people who are, who are giving in that situation, sharing your perspectives. 
you know, um, it's people who are asking questions and not afraid to, because you can be in a large room and be like, oh, I don't want to ask that question because I don't want to look s silly, right? And it's the person who asked it anyway. It's like, I don't know. Here's my question, you know, and thank God you asked it because I got to tell you yeah, something. You, you know, 25 people, 10 other people are asking it. You're just the one who spoke. That's leadership. Right. Anyway, so, so, yeah, sorry. I mean, that's okay. So, I mean, you're talking about a lot of good things here. And and by the way, I agree with you completely, but, but I also think that it needs to be noted that these are all learned behaviors, you know, do, 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 do a very small percentage of people probably have these naturally. Absolutely. But I also think that, that, that if you were just to kind of list out what you just said and go, Oh, I can be better here, or I can be better here, or I can be better here. Like, like I think leadership knowing what you just said or or knowing that those things is what creates leadership i also think that there are, there are things to to that you can be better at right like even when you were listening i was like oh yeah i'm pretty good at that oh i definitely need some work there I, i'm pretty good at that but oh i definitely need some work there you know as you're listing it off this is kind of where my head went and i would imagine a lot of people that are listening um uh, would, are, is in the same boat if i may and think about this as an approach and, and perhaps this will this will hit you know the people who check this out I encourage you to not look at it as a skill you need to learn. I encourage you to look at it as an ability that you need to reveal. Mm. Be in a room with four-year-olds. Trust me, they'll ask you a stupid question. They'll ask you any stupid question. They don't care who knows it or who doesn't. Mm -hmm. So actually, your ability to do that actually isn't something you need to learn. It's something you need to rediscover. Because whatever story happened, whether the teacher told you you were stupid, whatever person told you to shut up or sit down or whatever, that's actually what's inhibiting you. Your knowledge of how to do it isn't so much the issue. You're, you're uncovering through all of the crap that makes you feel that if I ask the wrong question, I'm going to be looked at like a moron. That's actually where the work is. And that's really different work. Because to learn, and what? And here we are again. To learn, oh, what do I need to learn? What do I need to uncover? What do I need to study? It's like, that's one thing. And please, be clear. Look, this is my family legacy. Books. I read like they're not making them anymore. Got it. You know, and there's a difference. Because there's a time for study, please. But there's a time for a lot of the things when we look at in leadership. Listening without judgment communicating openly, creating relationships. Look at any healthy child. And I say healthy child, not physically healthy, but healthy child who is uh, five or under and who is, in, um, who is with parents who are genuinely trying their best. Let me say that because there's no perfect parents. So everybody's stumbling through that crap, right? So there's that. Let me say that, you know, but genuinely from a place of heart, saying, I really want the best for this kid. And when you move into almost any arena like that, and you look at those type of children that are in that type of, um, in that way and given that uh, freedom to be that, yeah? You'll see all of these various different traits. They get beaten out of us. They get, these are little veils that we cover to protect ourselves from in the future looking silly because leadership is a constant act of putting yourself out there. And society, classic schools, meaning, you know, one through 12, you know, college times, you know, depending on your experience. These are the experience that allows, oh, wait a minute. I asked that question there. The teacher said this. People in the class laughed and we're done with those questions. And I remember when I suggested something and people said, uh, you know what? We're going to go with this person's idea now. Now I'm done making suggestions. See, these are the things that I would encourage us to look at. And it's not to say again, and I, and I, and I do want to say this, because what you said, sir, is a valid, very valid point. You know, these are skills. Leadership is a skill. You know, you can be taught it, you know, but a lot of the teaching of it is from observing. Like right now, to this day, Katie, as you, you, you detest, I still now, I'm, I've been a leader in PPD for a while. Wow, I'm learning a whole new set of things now in this new role with Kate. I'm learning from Kate all over the place, Do you know? And so I say that, and there's that study, but it's almost like an apprenticeship too. Look to those leaders that you, are, uh, that you really admire and be like, ooh, what are they doing? How are they doing that? Do you know? And, and know that 
if anything, if I teach anything, is anyone that's looking at what I do, it's here for you too. And a lot of it is, is about unlearning. It's not about learning. It's about unlearning. Ah, it's perfect for what you said about how we even start before we hit record about uh, Google. You know, it's about- Goggins. 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 Sorry, thank you. Google. Goggins. Goggins. Got it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, get the names right, Yurish. All right, anyway, right? And it's like, to that point, you unlearn, right? You unlearn the limitations that you put on yourself. Like like you were explaining, it's the guy with the pull-ups. It's like, oh, who told you all you could do was 10? I didn't say that. Your issue was you, I, oh, oh, you heard I said 10 all at one time. Hmm, interesting. It's more an issue of listening than it is about your ability. Hmm, how do we, how do we transform that with enough commitment, you could actually take the time to actually complete 100 pull-ups and that be true? Hmm, interesting. Really different conversation. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so that's what I would say with that as well. We have a lot more um, uncovering to reveal who we are than we than we believe, and we have a lot less um, learning new ways to be um, actually in truth than we believe. You know, we're 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 quite. I'm finding uh, quite complete the way we arrive. You know. And a lot of the fears and a lot of the paranoias and a lot of the ways we don't show up um, aren't because of a, a, of a, of a, a, a lack of uh, ability or, or capacity or I don't get math or, you know, that's a story I told myself for a long time, you know, whatever. It's actually um, just re re recognizing that all of that is, is for you too. Do you know what I mean? And you will have some natural inclinations to one thing or another. I'm naturally uh, more inclined to be creative, meaning art, visually creative, worth noting, because the person who designed this thing, this, this is a very creative mind. To look at the phone I grew up with and to come up with this is actually freaking amazing. Do you yeah. know what I mean? This ain't no phone like I thought of a phone. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't even know why they and call I'm, it a phone. <laughs> and I'm creative as hell, you dig? I'm not creative <laughs> like this. You know what I'm saying? And we forget that, you know? That's and awesome. that's what I would say to that, you know? And I think it's, um, a lot of people feel as though they can't, you know? I'm a lot of, this is my, this is my mission statement on my brand, actually, anything is possible. I'm a big believer in, in you can't. That's awesome. You know? So that's why I would say that, you know? That's awesome. Yeah, you know? Harish. Dude, I could listen to you for hours, for days, for months, for for now weeks. Now you get it. Now I get you get it. it. Now I get it. Katie, thank you so much for introducing us to your reach. I think this is the fastest hour yet. Ever. Yeah, it's like we sprinted to the we sprinted to the uh, to the end line, and there's not even an end line. It, it, it's absolutely amazing. Yurish, this is your opportunity to tell you tell our listeners how they can find you, where they can see you, yada 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 yada. Very cool. Um, you can keep up with me like on my daily shenanigans, a lot of it on the road, a lot with my wife. You can check that on, on out, out on Instagram. I'm at Y Style NY. Y Style NY. It's relevant because there's a number of different um, accounts that may be your ish, but I was hacked a year and a half, two years ago. So it's Y Style NY. That's why I'm bringing that to the attention. You can catch me on Facebook too, Uri at Yurish Style. Um, you can catch me LinkedIn. That's becoming a really relevant platform I'm finding too. Also Yurish Style. And if you really want to check out like what I do, um, um, images, who I am, learn more about who I am and, and the things that I, that of how I can ultimately, how I move forward and how I'd like to serve this industry, check out my website. It's www yurishstyle.com um, and spell yurish y-u-r-e-e-s-h and then style as in style s-t-y-l-e let me not assume everybody knows how to do it. so isn't that funny sometimes i like have the simplest word i'm like why am i not knowing how to spell here Oh, you know, I don't that know. happens constantly. Like, yeah. <laughs> so before I'm like, you know, like style, it's like, okay, wait a second. You know, so that's why I say. So yeah. And that's, and that's, 
And that's the biggest ways to get in contact with me um, and to see really what I'm up to and, uh, and how I serve this industry and uh, how, how, I, how I strive to ultimately walk the world, I think is what's most important. You know what I mean? And that's how you can get to check it out, check out at all that stuff. That's all. Awesome. That yeah. sounds awesome. And you just you, you just breathed in just some inspiration, some some freshness. And I truly, truly appreciate that, man. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. You know, it's so funny. I just saw you do this. I learned something recently. And I you may edit it out or find this is a cool way to end. You know, I've always done this. And just recently. I have a teacher who is teaching me what this means. And what it means is I cut through to the truth to you. And that's the way I speak to you. And that's the way I've spoken to all of you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yurish Hooker, thank you for hanging out with us. And thank you very, very much for joining us on your day. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.